Um, yeah, hello everybody. My name is Klaus. I'm a data scientist. I do quite some uh, machine learning and this is going to be an introductory talk. I'd like to encourage you to ask questions in the meantime. And since people are always a bit shy, I brought some sweets with me. So we have, I think, for 20 questions or so, little rewards. So please just raise your hand. And if we don't have the time or so, I will defer to you to the end of the talk. Or maybe we can um, discuss your question in the end. So um, yeah, I was lucky enough that this clickbait title was accepted. Uh, we will neither talk about AI nor about PowerPoint. This will be rather hands-on and will be about Python, as you may have guessed, since this is in this track. And uh, we'll start with a small, maybe a little bit uh, general introduction to mention a few important concepts. And then we'll spend the rest of the session with, um, with an example, uh, a sample, example use case where I will do some, some live coding so you can see how it feels like when you do machine learning with Python. So what is this example problem? Uh, the problem that we will uh, study is um, a rather widely used uh, test data set. It's the heart data set where you have a cardiovascular disease. You have about 300 patients. About a third of them are diagnosed with this disease. And we have about uh, 14 or 13, I'm not sure, clinical variables like uh, age, sex, whether they have uh, heart pain or not, uh, stuff like this. And what we would like to do is see whether we can predict the patient's condition based on the medical data that is available. We would also like to know which of these medical indicators are actually important, because usually you do machine learning to support some kind of decision-making process. And for example, in the clinical context, it can be rather expensive to make all these measurements. And therefore, it is interesting to see uh, which uh, indicators are actually of value when you want to make a prediction. We will um, need, of course, a metric that tells us whether with our model we are able to answer the questions we are asking. So we ask whether a patient is ill or not. So this is a binary classification problem. And the metric we will use is just uh, accuracy. So we want to see whether our model is right or wrong, and this will be fine for us. We will need a model to uh, learn something from the data, but this is something we will discuss later on. And for those who have uh, already heard about it, we will use scikit-learn. Before we go into details, can you please tell me, is who is already doing machine learning in here? Could you raise your hand, please? OK, that's great, because then this is the <laughs> perfect audience for this talk. Uh, are you all Python users or not? Who is not using Python? OK, mostly Python users. OK, who considers him or herself maybe scientist, engineer, or something like this? OK, and software developers? OK, OK, great. OK, thank you. So in machine learning, um, it's all about uh, methods, processes, tools that allow you to understand data. Personally, I prefer a bit more the term statistical learning, but it's a matter of, uh, of taste, I guess, and also use, usage. In, in a machine learning situation, there are basically four things that are always present. Of course, you have data because you want to learn something from this data. and very much enclosed with this data as a question that you're interested in. In our use case, we have clinical data, and the question is whether patients are ill or not. And these things are usually very closely related, and then define the metric which, which allows us to make a judgment on whether we are able to learn something or not. And from given our data and given the questions that we have, we make a decision and say, OK, I want to use this model or that model to 
extract meaning meaning from data. So it's not that I say, okay, I have, uh, let's say, a neural network, and now please um, give me some data and I will apply it. So it's really based on data and the question that you have. You make modeling decisions, you design your maybe your experiment or your engineering solution, and based on your expertise, you then derive a model to learn to extract meaning from, from the data. Very formally put, what you always uh, kind of assume is that you have an outcome, which is Y, and the outcome is the result of some, some underlying structure. For example, this is a disease, it could be a physical process, a chemical process, maybe a social economic process, whatever, which we denote just by F, and then there's also some error, epsilon. Maybe you've seen uh, stuff like this in school, but this is a very, very abstract form. And this F is some kind of unknown process that is shaping our data. And what we want to do is that we want to approximate the underlying process, F, by some other thing. We call it F hat. And when we put our data in there, we get an approximate output, which is then uh, Y hat. And sometimes we don't even know what the outcome is. For example, if, if you have a bunch of documents, you want to know what are these documents about, then you don't even know what to expect. You just want to see whether you can identify some underlying structure or not. OK, more or less? More or less, OK, good. If you have a machine learning uh, project, I would say that this is more or less into the, in the domain of data science. And if you're doing data science, you're usually um, dealing with a workflow that looks roughly like this. You have some data. You need to clean this data first. You need to make it manageable. Maybe you perform some transformations on a data to extract meaning. You explore it, you visualize it to get a feeling for what is going on. And then you want to apply a model, maybe to derive already first conclusions. And this is an iterative process. And every time you learn something, maybe you write a small report, you make a plot, you create a table, whatever. You discuss it with your colleagues, with your friends. But this is typically... Um, an iterative procedure and you are stuck in this <laughs> until you are able to extract uh, the answers that you were looking for. And for each of these uh, steps there are different tools and the tool that we will use um, for now is uh, is, uh, is scikit-learn for this modeling step. But since we will take a look at, at the real data set, we will also use pandas. Who is using pandas already? Any pandas users here? OK, a few. If you're interested, at 5 o'clock, there is another talk about pandas. Just saying. Um, this is something that we have to accept for now. So we don't have the time to go into pandas as well, but we will uh, create some overview plots, and then you will see that there are some input variables that affect the outcome. But what you see already is that when you, once you decide to do machine learning, you need to use a range of different sets, a range of different tools that all target uh, their respective uh, use cases, and we will focus only on, on scikit-learn for today. But this initial data exploration is really important because it, it actually it, it paves the way for all subsequent processing steps. So, it's, so if this is some kind of takeaway message, if you're new, want to start with machine learning, it's really worth paying quite some time and a very initial step where it's only about getting to know your data, where you want to see about distributions, whether variables are correlated, and uh, stuff like this. And another thing that is really important is that you usually need some kind of performance metrics, for example, for your model. You want to know, is this model better than some other model? Or you summarize your data by some simple 
number summaries. They could be complex, but still you want maybe to, to sort uh, different outcomes. But what is important to keep in mind is that number summaries are only a very rough description. And there are a few rather famous examples. Maybe you, you know them already, but I want to show them. This one is uh, rather old and quite famous. It's, it's called Enscom's Quartet. Who has not seen this before? OK, so this is really, really interesting. You have, uh, you have data. It's, 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 it's super simple. It's just, I think, it's 11 points or something. You have input x, and you have some output y. This is maybe a measurement or something. And in all these cases, you fit a regression line. OK, this is a very simple model. You fit a line, and as you see that all fits are exactly the same but the data looks dramatically different. OK, so if you want to summarize your data using a model like this, the model will say, OK, all these def the data sets are just the same. And in this case, it's, it's rather easy to spot that there is something wrong, <laughs> because we can plot it. But imagine that you have, for example, hundreds of clinical variables. It can easily happen that you miss the point. Therefore you have to compute metrics, because how do you want to understand the data if you cannot summarize it? But at the same time, it's important to keep in mind that the metric can be very misleading. Another example that is quite nice is the data thoroughs. You see? <laughs> so the point is that here we have again two two variables, one x, one y, and the mean of these variables is just the same, the standard deviation is the same, and the correlation between the variables is also the same. But obviously that's very different, right? They have a very, very different structure, but the number summary is just the same. And again, imagine that you have a lot of variables that are not that easy to visualize, because this is usually the problem. In a situation where you have only one x and one y, you make a plot, and that's fine. But typically, you use machine learning to uh, approach problems that are much more complicated than that. And then you have to rely on, on summaries like these. For example, I don't know what you discussed in the morning, but when you have a text processing application, you have huge vocabularies, and if you want to in analyze something, you're always in the situation that you have uh, quite, uh, quite a lot of, of variables. OK. Another, another very important concept that um, we should always keep in mind is that we have our data, and we want to learn something from the data. And usually, we expect our model to also work well on yet unseen data. OK, so maybe you have, we have now have this clinical data. We, we learn something from it. And then we have a new patient. And we want to um, be able to expect or be rather confident that when we have a new data point and we apply our old model to this data point, that this prediction that we get from this is rather reasonable. Um, and therefore, it is very important that during training and during learning, you separate uh, your data set into a training and a test set. And the test set is a part of the data that uh, during training the model never sees. And then you train the model on the training data, and then you evaluate it on the test data. You do this repeatedly, and then you can evaluate and see whether you are able to derive something that will also generalize in the future. And this uh, is a very nice uh, visualization, because it is very easy to learn everything a data set can tell you. You just have to find a, a, a model that is complex enough. We will see this uh, shortly. And this allows you to obtain really good training 
performance. So you just make a model that is able to capture all tiny details in your data set. That's fine, but this one will not generalize. And the situation where you don't generalize is typically called overfitting, because you learn too many fe features or properties of the data that do not generalize. And on the other hand side, you want to learn as much from the data as possible, because otherwise you are underfitting, meaning that you don't extract as much meaning as there is. And there is usually a, a sweet spot in the middle where you want to learn as much as possible without overfitting. Right. Question so far? It was a bit theoretical, I know. But if you feel confident, then let's continue. Hmm? The typical problem is to get a huge um, data set of data, right? Um, yeah, but this is usually the point where you cannot adjust. <laughs> yeah, so a, a lot of problems become much easier when you have enough data. I mean, apart from computational difficulties. Uh, but usually you have to go with what you have, um, and then it, that's a maybe a limiting factor, yes. <laughs> you see, it works. <laughs> OK, so uh, let's recall that we have this um, clinical, clinical example. Um, this one is just uh, the... So this one is just uh, the, the initial data exploration part. So I'll just scroll through it um, uh, because then we have more time for for later. But this is a Jupyter notebook. Um, it's basically a Python shell in the browser, which is nice because it supports markup like this. Um, and it's on, on GitHub. I will post the link also in the in the program after the talk is finished so you can download it is all self-contained there's also the data included okay so initially we just parse the data here we use pandas pandas is um, a really nice library because it supports data structures like uh, the data frame uh, which is basically a table which a lot of very useful methods for data exploration. And you have also some cool tools for, for I.O. processing, uh, like, wow, reading CSV files. But you can go <laughs> much further, of course. But for, for us, this is just fine. So here we have, this is our data. These are the first three lines of our data set. This is our target variable. Uh, the, the, the cardiovascular disease. So a patient is, uh, suffers from this disease if there is a yes, and he is in a healthy condition if there is a no. And we want to use all these remaining variables to make a prediction whether the patient is sick or not. Okay? Good. And one of these variables, for example, we have age, we have sex, we have chest pain, uh, rest blood pressure, uh, cholesterol and uh, and stuff like these, maximum heart rate and yeah, whatever there is available or whatever maybe a, a doctor said, okay, you should look at this variable. Some some very easy uh, descriptive statistics that you can achieve by just calling the describe method is um, uh, the classical number summary where you have mean standard deviation and uh, some some quantiles and also counts and we already see here that there is a variable that is missing a few data points we also see that the youngest patient is 29 and the oldest is 77 um, we have here a few categorical variables which only assume values 0 1 2 or here is um, 0 and 1 and here 0 2 3 but this is a very very basic summary this is something that is super cheap, you can always do it. Um, based from this, I derived that there are a few numerical variables and a few categorical variables, and a few categorical variables that are given as text. 
And for later processing, we have to convert all text variables into numeric variables. Um, and therefore, I, I summarized here a few, a few, uh, yeah, lists and gave them names to make to make life easier. One one of the first questions we should always ask is whether we have a balanced data set or not. In our case, we have um, a few more patients that are healthy compared to the ones that suffer from the heart disease. Um, if we want to know which variable has an effect or whether we can see if there is a difference between the groups, so we can um, say, give me all patients that are healthy and give me all patients that are um, that suffer from the disease and then take every single variable compute the mean and then compare it this is what you see here we group by the target variable we compute the mean and then we do some styling so pandas is extremely expressive if you want to uh, have nicely uh, nice summaries very quickly this is really really cool everything from the cursor onwards is just for styling but the actual computation is only this part here and we see that uh, all, it seems like all patients for example if you get older you're more likely to suffer from this disease okay also if you're male it's also more likely that you suffer from this disease okay so we, it seems like there is there are some variables that carry meaning and now we want to explore this a bit further Another thing that we can, for example, do is that we compare uh, the distributions of the variables. And here we see again, it, if, you are, if you suffer from, from this disease, it's more likely that you're older, but there is considerable overlap. Meaning that our model will have to disti distinguish between different variables as well. Assuming that these were separated like this, it would be super easy. But apparently, age seems to be an influencing factor, but there are also other, other important contributors. Again, we can also explore the categorical variables and compare the charts. But it's basically the situation is like this. There is no clear cutoff point that tells us, OK, you just have to look at one variable and it will tell you everything. We have to consider a range of different inputs. For, uh, for our further processing, we will convert now all text variables into factors. So we just replace, for example, the yes and the no in the outcome by 0 and 1. And we do the same for, uh, for the other text variables. And now we have a plain numeric array and we can try to do some processing with that. Okay. So far, so good? Great. So then let's proceed. There is the demo for demo. We just have to um, clear this a bit. Um, so this is our clean data set, OK? Very, very simple. What we now need to do is that we have to extract our input and our output. OK, we call the input x. Uh, and we add some, some new cells in here. So we have the input. And we know that uh, it's, it's all in this data frame. We just want the values. And there is a y, which we can also extract giving the target name and to save me some some typing i did it like this so what we want to do is uh, given what we had before is that we want to say something like this okay we want to predict y based on x using some kind of f what we have already learned before is that it is important to split uh, training and test data and the nice thing about scikit-learn is that it provides a lot of utilities to do just that 
Okay, so you know we have to separate our data sets into train and test. So there is a function that's called train test split, where we pass our variables x and y. And if we execute this and take a look at the shape of these arrays, we see that we have a larger training set and a smaller test set. Are you all familiar with NumPy arrays? More or less? Okay, so these are just plain NumPy arrays. You can be a bit uh, more specific here. Uh, for example, if you can specify the test size um, like this. But it's uh, now it's about one third for test, two thirds for training. That was pretty easy. Now, the, another cool thing in scikit-learn is that actually you can do a lot in very, with very little effort. So we have a classifier and as classification, uh, as classifier we, we take a decision tree and that's it. So this is already a machine learning model. It's a very simple one. We will go uh, into more details uh, shortly, but this is basically it. And if you want to train it, it has a method a train method where you pass the training data and this. Ah, it's of course called fit. Right, so this was it. That's it. That's basically machine learning. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so what's going on? The thing is that we learned already something from the data. You don't see it yet, but actually there was something going on. Uh, and we can make a prediction now on this on our holdout set by calling the predict method and here we pass the test data. So this was already learning, this is already the prediction and if you want to know how well we performed we can compute, um, let, uh, leave a little bit more space here, we can compute the confusion matrix you will see what this is uh, in a second. So this is a confusion matrix. It's a summary where you say, in reality, the patient suffered from the heart disease. And in 38 cases, the prediction was right. And in 14 cases, the prediction was wrong. On the other hand side, you have 14 cases where the patient was actually in a healthy condition, whereas our model said, no, you suffer from this heart disease. So this is what we will use for, um, for model evaluation. And all classifiers have a score method where you can pass the... Uh, the test data and this will give you the, the accuracy. So in about 72% of the cases we were right and in the other cases we did a mistake. Okay, so question is what is this decision tree? Um, do we have chalks? Right. It's great if there is a blackboard. <laughs> So the decision tree, maybe you know it already, but just to, to make sure, um, the decision tree is really a very, very simple model. It's useful in our case because it can deal with categorical uh, variables without any, any further tuning. Say we have a variable A and we have a variable B and we have a few data points that are like this and we want to separate it. So we have a group and we have a group X and we want to separate them and the decision tree tries to partition the input space and, as, and, and form groups that are homogeneous. Okay? And if you want to partition this input space, I guess what you would do is that you draw a line here and say, okay, everything left of this line is in this group and everything right of this line is in this group. So this is already a very simple approach to do it. It's, it's, it's rule-based, it's very easy to interpret. And what we have is that we have a first node 
in our tree, right? So we have a tree structure and the first node says that, for example, if this is one and this is zero and this is zero and again this is one, then there is a first node and the first node says that if A is smaller or equal to one half, yeah, well, if this is the case, so if this is true, uh, then we are in O, and if this is false, then this is X. This is already fine, we did classification. Usually the situation is a bit more complicated. For example, you have another variable here and another one here. This means that we will re require additional splits, additional partitions, and we can do this, for example, by adding a new uh, separation here. Okay, so in the first round we partitioned the space using this uh, cutoff. In the second round we have another condition that says that we want B to be smaller than, I don't know, maybe 0 0.75, which allows us to separate these two. And apparently if we want to classify this one here below uh, exact as well, we will need yet uh, yet another one, so this is below, so then here we have another condition uh, which says maybe, I don't know, b equals uh, maybe one half, also uh, 0 0.1, and then you have these um, leaf, leaf nodes, and what you want to have is that in all these nodes you only have neighbors of the same kind, okay? And I guess you can imagine that you can, yeah, be as finely grained as you like. So you can learn everything, basically. You can always find a petition that works. Okay? So this is a decision tree. Rule-based, very simple, very, very easy to, to use. So what is the problem here? We can check and also compute the score on the training set. And the score on the training set is one, meaning that during training, we got everything right, and during testing, we made mistakes. So this is exactly the situation that I mentioned before, that we tried to learn a lot, but obviously it does not generalize, and a very, um, convenient way to to play around with this is the example that I've provided here. So we have data, the data is a sign, you have measurements which are the green or black dots, and then you have a model that tries to learn um, how this data behaves. Okay? And what we have here is this very simple decision tree with the same setting that uh, you have seen in the other case. And what it does is that it partitions this input space until every single data point is correctly classified. And obviously, you learn here a lot of weird things, right? Because here these are obviously outliers and you don't want them to influence the result that dramatically. And what you can then do is that you choose the parameters and restrict the flexibility of the model. So we regularize the model, and what we can do, for example, is that we don't want partitions that are so small that there are only one sample, that there is only one sample left. And what we can do is, for example, we can require, we want only partitions where we have at least five samples in the data point, in the, uh, five samples in the partition. Okay, and now this looks much more sane, and you have uh, different uh, methods to do it. For example, you can also say, I don't want more than one split, for example, and if you do it like this, the model produces this kind of output, because we only allow for one, for one cutoff value. The most sensible cutoff value here is one half, but obviously here we are underfitting, because it, it looks like if you allow more cutoff values, then uh, you're, you get a better approximation. 
Okay? So it seems like there are parameters, and these parameters allow you to tune the model. Uh, fortunately, this is, uh, this is the case. And since we don't have that much time, I will just quickly jump to the demo and uh, just um, copy something over. And the thing is that you can say, I have a parameter and I want to vary this parameter and then see what happens. And this is basically uh, what scikit-learn allows you, it's called validation curve. And this is what we see. So we vary the number of samples that are allowed to remain in the partition. We go from 1 to 30. And if we, have, uh, we allow for every single data point to be alone, then we are in the situation that we have seen before. So you have 1 for training accuracy, but you're rather bad in test on the test set. And once you restrict the model, you, you regularize the model a bit more, the test accuracy increases. Of course, training accuracy decreases, decreases, and there is this sweet spot in the middle, and this is the parameter set that makes sense. Okay? <coughs> so, yet we still have a model that told us something about the data, and some models allow you to extract feature importance. So we said at the beginning we have this clinical data, we want to know which variables are important, and some models uh, give you this, uh, this information, and what we can then do is that we say uh, feature importances, which we uh, compile into a data frame, and we have the decision tree. So we just collect this one here, and then we give it an index. Um, And since now we have this table, we can sort and see which variable um, is most important for this model. So we sort by the variable that's called decision tree, and we want, want to have it uh, in descending order, ascending values. Right, so apparently for this model, the most important variable is chest pain. And it seems to make sense, right? If you go to the doctor and if you have chest pain, maybe there is a problem. So this is something that we learn. And there are also some other variables that, according to this model, don't, do, not carry, do not carry meaning. Um, OK, some information that we extracted from the data. Another thing that is rather nice is that since Scikit-learn uh, is some kind of default uh, standard for machine learning in Python. There are a lot of libraries uh, created in this ecosystem that expect scikit-learn uh, objects or models. And then you can pass, um, for example, a classifier. classifier uh, and it will draw you the decision tree. So you can expect it. And this is the problem that we had before. Um, just let me, let's, let's color it also. Oh, it's not called fill. What is it? Hmm? Filled. Mm. Right. And what we see here is that we have this rather complicated structure where we do all these splits and end up in two small regions that are not representative of what is actually going on. Now I will do some cheating. 
so you see the rest of the demo as well, and maybe we have time for questions. So this is the example that we don't like. So what we want to do is that, given that we already know that some parameters can be used to increase test accuracy, we want to perform a parameter search. And this is actually quite simple, because you just provide a parameter grid and say, I want to perform a search over the product of all input variables. Here I use this max depth parameters and min sample sleeve parameter that you have seen already before. And then you have a grid search class that you pass a classifier, a grid, and then you say, I want to have these grid shirts be performed on five different splits of the training data. And once you execute this, you can then uh, again compile a table and the best parameter combination that we have in this very small setting is that we can, for example, set the minimum number of uh, data points in the final partition, for example, to be 15. Or similarly, we can also restrict the depth of the classifier. And this one is, is better. It's almost 10% better than the one that we had before. And if we want to visualize this one, it's kind of also visually makes more sense because it's much clearer uh, structured. And what we have here is the property that you try to have classes that are uh, separations that are rather pure. So on the right hand side is mostly red, on the left hand side is mostly blue. And in the cases where it did not work out, you add additional splits to capture these relationships. So. This is a decision tree. This is very basic. And maybe you know uh, from, from your personal experience that if you are unsure, you maybe ask another person. Right? You go to the doctor. Doctor says, ah, hmm, maybe you have to go to surgery. Then you go to another one. <laughs> OK, so this is very common. And in machine learning, you can do the same. You can decide, OK, I have a model. I want to use, uh, build another model. And then you compare them and you aggregate the opinions of different models. But this only works if the models are independent, right? If you have uh, a friend and you ask for her opinion and the second friend is maybe her best friend and maybe the opinions will be rather correlated and there's not much additional value. What you want to do is that you have uncorrelated models and one easy way to do it is that you draw random subsets of the data and fit models independently. And since this is rather popular um, and rather successful, it's called the random forest because you, for example, fit in parallel 100 decision trees, so not only one, but 100 different ones, on 100 different data sets that are all subsets of the original data. And then you can hope that although maybe one of these is overfitting, the other, other trees will overfit again, but on different data sets. And on average, they will have um, a more sensible opinion. And then you have this random forest classifier. It's the same structure as we had before. You, have, you initialize it, you fit, and you make a prediction. And when we do this, we see here this was the original decision tree that we have, the single one. And here we have the random forest, and we see that we are immediately much better in the cases where we made mistakes. Because now we have a lot of different experts, we ask for all of their opinions, and then we aggregate. And now we have about uh, an accuracy of 85%. 80, sounds, sounds nice. And uh, we can again inspect feature importance. And what is interesting here, that while the decision tree said chest pain is really important, the random forest now says maximum heart rate is very important. Hmm. So this is something that uh, it's uh, important to keep in mind that while it is very easy to compute something, it's often not that easy to really get to the to the core of, of the matter. Actually, we don't have time for further details, but we can um, discuss this maybe, maybe afterwards. I'll just go switch to my slides.
maybe this one is a good to end the talk, <laughs> but I still have one minute, <laughs> so there is uh, yeah maybe some some concluding remarks in what is really great about scikit learn is that it's it offers a super super convenient API um, and you may be left with the impression that um, you just apply the most complex model and then you will get the best results, but this is not the case. So there is no free lunch if you want to Google it. There are nice publications, so there is no one single model that will be the best on all data sets. Another thing that I think is worth mentioning is that once you do machine learning, it is very much the case that in very few lines of code, a lot of things can happen. and this dramatically increases code complexity. So managing complexity in code is already tricky, but with machine learning I think it's even uh, more of a challenge. And this is basically it. I would have accepted questions, but we have to leave. It's end. I don't know. Do we have a few minutes or? Yeah, a few minutes, okay. There is a question. Bounty? <laughs> of the training sets of the training values and how um, is that process um, working of choosing them arbitrarily? Um, okay, I'm not sure if I understood the question correctly. You're asking how to choose the parameters of the models. Mm -hmm. So here in this demo, I, I chose oh, it arbitrarily. What are you training exactly? During training, do you mean the parameters of the model or, for example, where how these cutoff points are calculated? The parameters of the model. The parameters of the model. So, um, this is what you do with this cross validation. So, for example, we have a, the grid search here. In the grid search example, I specified the parameter grid based on some gut feeling. If you are unsure, you can make a larger grid and perform, for example, a randomized search. So usually you do randomized searches because if the model is expensive to, to fit, you don't have time to wait for a full grid. For example, it may, you may easily have a grid that spans thousands of values. That's not possible to perform an exhaustive search, but this is how you do it. You specify a set, a search space, and then you do a cross-validated search and estimate the best parameters. Again, and <laughs> okay. Um, if you've got <coughs> your par parameters and you have an assumption about them, so putting weight on different parameters, would this be a counter pattern to machine learning? As we said, for example, chest pain uh, might be in the real world a sure sign that you maybe have a disease. Yeah. So if you would uh, already uh, put a little bit of weight on this pattern, uh, on this parameter, would this be a counter pattern for machine learning? Because we saw on one tree, with uh, the value for chest pain and the high correlation with the disease is high, and the other model not. But in the real world, we know that there is probably a high uh, correlation between this. So putting an extra weight on this parameter, this one parameter, is this counter pattern to machine learning or or not? Um, well, if you say that you want the model to derive it, I would just leave the model as is. If you say that you want to include um, another variable, you can also say, okay, then I build another model and then you see what performs best. But here in this case, for example, it would not make sense to put more emphasis on this variable because the model makes the decision for you whether it makes sense or not. But they are really asking me to end this talk. Okay, thank you very much. If you have questions, I'm here. I'll add the link uh, to the slides and to the repository to the, um, to the talk listing, so in a few minutes it will be online. You can take a look. Thank you very much.